Hi, I'm Mark from Pavestone and I'm on site today to show you how to lay Pavestone natural stone paving, which includes sandstone, limestone and slate. These are all the tools that you will need for the job. Most of these you will probably have in your shed or your garage, but some you may need to buy from your local builders merchants or DIY store. And these are all the tools you will more than likely need to hire from your local tool hire store. These are the materials for the job. And finally, the all important safety gear, essential for all installations. This homeowner previously had a natural sandstone patio here that had been laid in correctly. I've ripped that paving out and I'm now going to dig down for the all important sub base. I've dug out the majority of the soil and the rubble in this area. It's not at the correct depth yet. What I want to do is show you how to mark out for the exact dimensions of your patio. And to do that, we'll use a square, some marking paint, and I'm also going to use a length of timber. So let me show you how you do it. First, I will start by marking where the back of this patio will be, right next to the flower bed. A mark at 1.8 metres for the width, and another one at 2.7 metres for the length. Now, using the set square, I will join up all the marks. I'm using the timber as a straight edge to extend the square. At the end, run a tape from corner to corner diagonally and you will get the same measurement. So that's this area all marked out and as you can see we've got the perfect shape for this patio. What I'm now going to do is just trim this turf off the edge and then I'll push on and get it dug out to the correct depth. Bang a timber peg in one corner so it finishes flush with the grass and another one in the next corner. Make sure that your pegs are on the previously marked lines. I'm able to use my long spirit level but you can use a shorter one and rest it on a long piece of timber. You can see this is level so a few more taps on this peg to get the right fall. There we go, the paving is now falling at 1 in 60 towards the lawn. A little detail here, I've marked on this peg where the 100mm of subbase will finish, the 40mm of laying bed and the top of the peg is the top of the slab. Next set the string line which needs to be level. Bang another peg in the corner and run a string line across. Always make sure the string line is nice and tight. The string has a slight fall on it, so a couple of taps, recheck with the spirit level and that's it, a level string line. So I've set all the string lines up and this patio is now falling towards the lawn. So the surface water is going towards the lawn and it's perfectly level running this way. I can now work out how much we need to dig out to get to the 150 to 160 millimetres deep. Here it's around 120 millimetres so I've got a bit to dig out here. I'm going to pull the string line and we'll check that way so I can work out how much I need to dig out there. So just a quick check on the falling line and at the moment the depth is around 130 millimetres so there's about 30 or 40 millimetres of soil to come off across the whole area. I'm going to crack on that, get this all dug out. Digging out the correct depth is essential. Cutting corners now is likely to cause the new paving to sink and fail in the future. If you're laying your patio next to your house, the finished height should be 150 millimetres or two full bricks below the damp proof course. Okay, so this area has now been dug out to around 150, 160 millimetres deep. One thing to be aware of, make sure it's a nice firm base. Best way to do that, just dig the heel of your boot in, if it doesn't sink in, that's fine. If it sinks in a bit, just dig a little bit more out. The next stage for this project is to get the subbase in. The subbase should be MOT Type 1, which is readily available from your local builder's merchant. Barrow it into the area, taking care of the strings. You'll need to get it to about half the depth of what is required. Keep raking it round to get it as level as possible. Okay, so we've put about half of the subbase in. It's around about 50 to 60 millimetres thick. Just a quick check with the tape measure, which we keep doing as we're going all the way round. 
We're also about halfway up the gauge that we marked earlier on on the peg. So the next stage is to get the wacker plate into the area and pass it over about four or five times. Compact the sub base down using a vibrating plate. This is another essential part of the project and poor compaction will cause the patio to fail. Check the depth of the compacted sub base and top up across the whole area. It's important to put the sub base in in two stages to ensure maximum compaction. A rake around, check the depth again and get the vibrating plate back in the area for a final compaction and I like to do this about seven times. The sub base material is all in the area now. It's been fully compacted and remember, you can never over compact the sub base. The finished depth is around 60 millimeters from the top of the sub base to the string line. And that means we've got 40 mil for the laying bed and 20 mil for the actual slab. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to mix up some priming slurry and some laying mortar and start laying the patio from this corner. As this is a rectangular patio and it's positioned in the middle of the garden, it doesn't need any cutting. If your project does require cuts, watch the How to Cut Natural Stone video at pavestone.co.uk. Now I've been busy mixing up the laying mortar. It's a simple mix, five parts sand to one part cement. This is the consistency that we're looking for. A nice creamy mix, perfect consistency, any wetter, and the slabs will just slide around as you're laying them and make it a nightmare. Any stiffer and the slabs could crack as you're banging them down. Now I'm gonna get this mix out of the barrow and start laying the paving. The first slab of any project is an important one as all the other paving will follow its falls. So it's worth spending a bit of extra time on this one. Place the mortar in the corner and spread it round using either a float or a trowel. It's essential that we prepare what is known as a full contact mortar bed. Basically, this means that the whole of the back of the slab is in full contact with the bed and there are no voids. With this particular product, there is an element of dust that settles on the back as part of the manufacturing process. It's essential that this dust is removed before you apply the priming slurry. It's a simple task. You can either just rub it off, a stiff brush is the best method, or even a hose pipe and a watering can. It's really important this dust is removed. Okay, so the laying bed is down for the first slab. Now before I lay the slab, I must prime the back of every slab using the pavestone priming slurry. Now this is essential to create a strong glue bond between the slab and the laying bed. So, here's my priming slurry and I'm going to apply it using a paintbrush, but you could use a paint roller. When applying the priming slurry, it's important that it goes right to the edge of every slab. A top tip is to rest the slab on a couple of bits of timber and this stops you getting stones or debris on the brush and onto the back of the slab. Now that the slab's primed, carefully lower it down onto the bed. Tap it down to create a bond and make sure that the edges of the slab align with the string. Here I am using a spirit level to check that the slab is just touching the string line. A few final taps and then give the slab a good clean down with a brush and water. Tapping the slab down onto the bed can cause mortar to creep up the gap between the slabs. I'm going to use pavestone point fix in the joints and the depth of the gaps must be a minimum of 24 millimeters. I find that this narrow trowel is great for removing any excess mortar that's in the joint, plus it takes seconds to do it now rather than trying to scrape it out later. Keep checking that the slabs are all level and that there are no obvious dips from one slab to the next. As I continue laying, you'll see that I keep cleaning the pavement as I go and it's also really important to keep checking that the slabs are following the string lines. The joy of natural stone is that there are no two slabs the same, however the colours can sometimes be very similar. So my next slab would be this one, but you can see it creates a lot of yellow in this area. So I'm going to swap that one 
and we're going to use this one because it's got lots of ready pink tones. Now this is what we call colour blending and that will continue with this tapestry of colours across this sandstone patio. If your project has more than one pack of paving, it's essential that you pick and lay paving from different packs. This will ensure that the colours are blended across the whole patio. If you accidentally get priming slurry on your gloves and then onto the face of the slab, it's essential that it's removed straight away with a brush and water. Here's another example of a full contact mortar bed only this time I'm using a trowel instead of a float and it shows that either tool works fine. So you've heard me talk a lot about a full contact mortar bed. I'm going to lift this slab up and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by a full contact mortar bed. Here goes. And there you have it, a full contact mortar bed. Many installers like to prepare the bed using this method. It creates ridges of mortar and if done correctly, the mortar settles flat and a full contact bed is still achieved. The same applies, tap the slab down onto the bed and give it a clean down. And there it is, another full contact mortar bed. The final slab's going down. Check the levels, clear any mortar out the joints, and the last clean down. Paving's all laid, and I've given it a very light rinse over with the hose pipe. The next stage of this project is to do the pointing, so I'll return tomorrow morning to do that once it's hard enough for me to stand on. People often ask, why do you need to use a priming slurry? This slab was laid yesterday, so I'm going to lift it and show how the priming slurry creates a bond between the back of the slab and the laying bed. So, as you can see, there's the back of the slab and that is a solid bond between the laying bed and the slab. It's even brought up some of the subbase with it. That's absolutely stuck solid and is the reason you should use priming slurry. Okay, so the paving's all laid and the beds are now hard enough for me to be able to stand on. That means I can get on with the next stage, which is pointing the paving. And for that, I'm going to use this Pavestone Point Fix All Weather Jointing Compound, which is a great product to point natural stone paving. However, there are one or two key points that I will talk to you about to make sure that this product is installed correctly. The first key points, the depths of the joints. These must all be a minimum of 24 millimetres. The joint widths, a minimum of six millimetres. And any debris in the joints, this all has to go. Right, I'm about to start pointing the paving using the point fix. But if you want more details on how to mix and apply this product, visit the website pavestone.co.uk. As you open the tub, you will find two bags of product. One bag has the coloured sand and resin in, and the other contains sand and hardener. It's essential that equal quantities of product from each bag are mixed together thoroughly. Now I'm just finishing off mixing both bags of product and I'm making sure that I get all the unmixed product off the bottom and the sides of the tub. Give the paving a quick sweep to remove any debris and then tip the point fix onto the first area. I always like to give it a final check just to make sure that it's fully mixed now it's out of the tub. We've just had a bit of rain but it's not a problem as point fix can still be applied even in wet weather. Point fix can be applied in all weathers unless it's a very hot day or really cold as long as the surface temperature is above 3 degrees and below 26 degrees Celsius, it will be fine. Next, spread the point fix over the paving using either a brush or a trowel. 
press it into the joints, I'm using a brick jointer, before sweeping off any excess and giving it a second compact down. This is an example of a fully compacted joint. Keep moving the point fix around the joints with a brush, compacting, topping up and compacting again thoroughly as you go. Now I will give the first area a thorough sweep over. Okay, I'm about halfway across the patio now with the point fix. Just very quickly, what I'm doing is I'm sweeping the excess on a diagonal. Never come along the joints because you'll just pull the product back out. So sweep across the diagonal and when you find your joint, you can use either of these types of pointing bars going in and this is essential that you compact the product into the joint really press it in a final sweep over bring all this excess out the way now onto the next area go in on that diagonal and then a final rub over over all those lines and it's as simple as that Nearly at the end, so just sweep the small amount of point fix into a pile. Any product that has gathered in the natural profile of the stone can easily be removed as you sweep down. I've mixed the whole tub, which is why I have some left over. Unfortunately, now it's mixed, it has to be thrown away. If you have a small area to point, just mix a small but exact equal quantity from each bag. The advantage of point fix is that any unmixed material can be stored in the tub and used at a later date. A final sweep over the whole patio now and take care not to stand on the joints. The last stage is to sponge off any excess point fix from the face of the paving with clean water. Okay, job done. A whole new patio installed using Pavestone Natural Sandstone and what a transformation. From a previously incorrectly laid patio to a beautiful sun terrace that the homeowner can now relax on and enjoy. For more installation hints and tips, visit the website pavestone.co.uk.